Hello and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a James Bond cinematic rewatch podcast. My name is Graham. Joining me is Matt. Hi, how's it going? It's going well. It's uh, This is the first episode we've recorded since the thing actually launched. And so unlike in episode two, where I just pretended that you all had nice things to say, I can actually now say with confidence that most of you have nice things to say. So thank you. <laughs> 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 no, it's the, the the response has actually been been really good. So we really appreciate that. This is something that Matt in particular, but that both of us have been really looking forward to doing for a while now. So it's it's great to see so many responses ranging from like, oh great, an excuse to crack them out and watch them again to, you know, I've only ever caught half of one on TBS. So this will be really interesting for me. So it's 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 really great. Yeah, I'm really excited to see how excited everyone is about it. I have to admit, I may have read the comments and they were, as you say, mostly nice. So that was an affirming Internet experience for me. Yeah, I have one mere comment etiquette request for all of you kind people, which is that when I intervene with fun trivia, I'm not necessarily dispensing every single morsel of trivia information that may exist for a given movie as many people have already brought up even for dr no that there's lots of other interesting stuff to talk about and that's great uh if you know if you want to throw that in there in the comments and be like you know here's some other interesting fun facts that's awesome just please a, a request from me don't word it as here's some things you missed because that implies a failure of some form <laughs> on our part Whereas I'm simply choosing to not share, you know, the entire trivia page from IMDb. You know, if if you crave every <laughs> single piece of trivia, you know, get the DVDs, listen to all the commentary tracks, you know, feel free to osmosis all of the information into your brain. But this is, you know, we're trying to keep this to a mostly listenable, like 90-ish minutes. And, uh, you know, it's it's not all going to come through. That said, I was a little embarrassed to realize that I hadn't even considered the correct pronunciation of Honey Rider's name from the books. It was actually meant to be a, a heavy dialect. And uh. yeah, I'm kind of glad I didn't say that out loud. So anyway, <laughs> but today, however, we are looking at the fifth James Bond movie and the last for now for Sean Connery. <laughs> He'll only be back twice more. Yeah, exactly. It's a very silly thing to say, you know, his his last Bond film. But no, we are looking at You Only Live Twice from 1967, directed by Lewis Gilbert, who would direct three James Bond films. He would direct this one, The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. That's quite a resume. Yeah, it's an interesting spread of Bond films, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and, The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker kind of makes sense because they're sort of of a pair, although vastly different in style and, and content. But they are at least like Moonraker sort of functions as an almost a direct sequel in certain ways to The Spy, Spy Who Loved Me. But that's that's quite a spread. He apparently was convinced to direct this by the producers i think perhaps saltzman in particular because he was he was not really sure he was like ah, i don't think i should do this no actually i'm going to turn it down and uh saltzman was basically like you have to this is a james bond movie this is the biggest audience you'll ever have and i yeah, mean yeah. to an extent that's hard to hard to disagree with screenplay normally of course uh, richard maybaum has been involved in the screenplay for the first four bond films but screenplay for this one by rolled doll now you may be thinking wait rolled doll that's the author who did like james and the giant peach and charlie and the chocolate factory this is in fact the same person yes it is that yeah. rolled doll yeah it's like fantastic mr fox the bfg you know the 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 witches you know like that that rolled doll the the one that does like sort of weirdly off kilter children's books yes that role doll <laughs> apparently <laughs> he was a friend of ian fleming's but not a friend of this book <laughs> <laughs> he apparently he considered the book of you only live twice one of fleming's worst works wow because he considers it less of a novel and more of a travelogue 
because essentially <laughs> Fleming went to Japan and was like, oh, I love Japan and wrote an entire James Bond book that has like this thin veneer of a plot over laboriously describing Bond experiencing a bunch of things in Japan. Okay. I can see how that was translated into this film. Well, yeah. So basically Dahl was like, I have nothing really to work with here. So I'm going to take a lot of inspiration from Dr. No from that movie and sort of rework the novel of You Only Live Twice into a filmable movie that actually works, taking inspiration from earlier from earlier Bond outings. And apparently Lewis Gilbert was very involved, but Dahl said that he was... Do you know that Roald Dahl said that of all of his works that have been adapted to the screen, he was most proud of this. Really? In terms of the adaptation because he worked with Gilbert on a lot of character stuff and plot stuff, sort of discussing it. And then Gilbert went, okay, good. You and I are on the same page. You go write it. Dahl went and wrote it. And Gilbert said, great, and shot the script. And that like didn't try to change it after it was written, right? And right. so Dahl was like, I wrote it, and he shot what I wrote, and that was it, rather than all of his other movies, which of course were you know, adapted from his own written works. And so I don't think any author is ever going to be 100% happy with how their written work gets adapted for the screen. And so, you know, it's just sort of interesting to read that. The budget of $9.5 million, by far the most so far, $72 million adjusted for inflation. The box office take of, am I reading this right? $111 million in its day. So eight hundred and fifty-five million dollars. So we're not we're no we've no longer cracked a billion dollars in its day. Now we know why they replaced Sean or Sean Connery. The uh, the box office take of the Bond franchise was on a downward slide. Connery was sick of this. Oh, well, no doubt. They paid him a bunch of money for this, but he was like, okay, but I he again. This, these are all apocryphal stories, things like this. But apparently, he didn't even want Saltzman and Broccoli on set. He was just like, I just, I, I, I'm not getting along with these men right now. And so if you want me to do a good job, they can't be here. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I was like, like very, very not on the same page off camera, but the on camera, I don't think suffered. Like he, I teased this movie at the end of the last episode being like, oh yeah, I remember that only that one thing. And I didn't remember any other part of this movie. <laughs> Ah. I remembered that and that Donald Pleasance played Blofeld. And that's all I remember. And then I watched this one and I was like, wow, I don't remember any of this. So I guess let's get into talking about the movie. Sure. So pre-roll sequence. (laughs) Exterior space. (laughs) Yeah, exterior (laughs) space is right. We open to uh, a NASA spacecraft in orbit. The two astronauts aboard are prepping for a spacewalk. They are they're in orbit of Earth. You know, one of the astronauts is about to go on a spacewalk. It looks like it's an experimental spacewalk, presumably being 1967. I guess we're still in the lead up to the moon landing, right sort of at the height of the space race. Anyhow, one of the NASA astronauts is going out on a spacewalk just to make sure that the, the various spacewalk apparatuses are functioning correctly. They, they crack open the crack open the hatch on on the the space pod they're in and he drifts out into space and has a conversation with with mission control back in in houston i assume or houston as someone says at one point yeah as he's experimenting with his maneuvering apparatus houston sees a bogey appear on their radar screens it's coming up from behind they can't see it you know they're nobody's quite sure what it is but it's rapidly approaching from behind when suddenly the spacewalking astronaut sees it off in the distance there's another spaceship that other spaceship rapidly approaches them before beginning to op- overtake and as it as it reaches them the front end of the spaceship begins to crack open and it swallows the pod whole and as the hatch on the front of this spaceship closes around the orbiter it severs the umbilical of one of the astronauts and he drifts away into space the unknown spaceship continues on its way having enveloped <laughs> And captured the American ship. Yeah, the the nose cone opens like I don't know, like a like a four part beak 
I guess. It just sort mm-hmm. of goes like and goes completely around it and then just swallows it. So this happens. <laughs> it's actually a really great scene. I like this scene a lot. It's like a good, very different from anything we've had so far, but it's just like a, a fun. Oh, this is very sci fi. Yeah, they've, uh, they've gone all out here. Star Trek, the original series began airing in 1966. So, you know, we were definitely in, as you say, you know, like the the space race and everything. We were definitely in, you know, space time, you know. So how do you how do you get that involved in a James Bond movie? Well, (laughs) by having by having spacecraft kidnapped. So from here, we cut down to what appears to be a diplomatic meeting between the United States, the UK and the Soviet Union, the U.S., basically says we believe you did this to the soviets being like you you clearly did this you're trying to undermine our advancement in the space race if this happens again we will deem it an act of war and the the cold war will go hot russia is like that's nonsense what are you talking about of course we didn't do this why would we do that the uk sort of like treads the line between them being like well actually we're not convinced that russia did this because the telemetry we have says that the spacecraft that swallowed the Jupiter 16 landed in the Sea of Japan area. The U.S. is like, well, obviously it's not Japan. They don't even have the capability to do this. And the Brits are like, well, fear not. We, Our man in Hong Kong is working the case right now. The the UK delegate is such an insufferable ass too. <laughs> he, he he lets the US and USSR delegates bicker for like a solid two minutes before he's like, "Now, gentlemen, you see our intelligence." <laughs> and it's like you you wiener. It's great. By the way, they're in this amazing set. That's I don't know what the exterior is. I assume it's like some sort of weather station or observatory or something. But it's a giant. It's two giant geodesic domes or spheres and then it's they mocked up this set to look like it's inside it like there's some sort of un or g8 meeting inside this dome and it's just really cool not only does the u.s say that further interference will be considered to be an act of war but they announce when their next intent to launch a spacecraft is right in a week's time we will be launching another one and interference with that craft will be considered an act of war so we we cut to the man in hong kong and who is it it is none none other than James Bond himself, and he is working quite literally as he is currently in bed with I think I think she's just Ling mm-hmm. is the only name she's given. And you know, they're they're making out in bed. They're having some conversation about the the various things that he's doing. And she gets out of bed and he's sort of like talking about getting her back into bed and she runs over to a wall and flips a switch which causes the the like wall bed to flip back up into the wall just in time for a bunch of thugs to run in with machine guns and shoot up the bed this of course leads to the local police to come running so all all of the the local like hong kong police descend on this building after after she and the thugs have made their escape and run in and you know responding to shots fired and they they walk into the apartment the leader notices that there's a the bullet ridden bed there so he's like quickly over the bed and they pull down the bed and surprise james bond is dead again he got shot up he's dead the deputy we assume he's a deputy mentions that bond died quote on the job which is to say engaged in sex (laughs) to which the superior officer comments well that's how he would have wanted it yeah implying that they know who bond is and then yeah the camera pans down and there's blood leaking out of bond on the bed and then we cut to the opening titles yes we do so unlike from Russia with Love, where we see James Bond die and then there's a mask revealed to be like, oh, no, it's not actually him. This is Bond's dead. Opening titles. <laughs> now, the real like power move here would have been to have the rest of the movie with a different agent. They were never in a million years going to do that. But that would have been the real power move here. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been amazing? <laughs> Uh, they could still do it in a future movie, I suppose. It it occurs to me now that I'm thinking about it because we've had Bond is dead. Mm-hmm. We've had uh, there's a casket with JB on it. Oh, wait, no, Bond's not dead. Mm-hmm. Then there's 
Bond is dead. And then there's a future one that we will get to much later on that I can think of off the top of my head that is like Bond is dead. How many other Bond is dead openings are there in this franchise? Because now I'm worried that there's more than I remember. I truly do not recall. But then I think I've maybe seen this movie once prior to this to this watching. So, I mean, in its entirety, again, right. You can always catch parts of it on a marathon on TV when back yeah. when I lived at home and had cable. I'd, I'd forgotten this is how this one started. But then yeah. we get into a, an opening title sequence, making a lot of use. And once again, of silhouettes of naked women and the sort of skeletal structure of a parasol and lots of sort of lava and volcanoes, volcanoes relevant later in the movie. Yeah. And the song. You Only Live Twice, sung by Nancy Sinatra. Ah, okay. Not written by, right. but performed by Nancy but Sinatra. performed by, yeah. Is it is it John Barry again? Uh, John Barry did the music, and the main title lyrics were by Leslie Bricuse, or Bricuse. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce her last name. I apologize. But much more of a low-key title track than the last couple. Yeah, this one is much more like almost love ballady, i guess yeah bond themes tend to go in two directions either the bombastic you know thunderball or this more sort of you know for your eyes only right like you've got <laughs> i like that you went to for eyes for your eyes only which, it's the one that like, sticks with me the most as like the the ballad style bond theme you know yeah easily one of my least favorite bond themes but i like I, I love it, it is i completely would have probably done the same thing because it is so <laughs> iconic <laughs> this one's really good though like yeah. i think as this style of bond themes go this one's really good i was jamming out to this tune it's like it's a banger for as love ballads go i will say that i am is it bias if it's just your opinion? It's just my opinion. Uh, I prefer <laughs> for Bond movies to have more of a the 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 bigger, more bombastic theme songs. I find the the sort of the low key ones kind of like, eh, you know. I mean, yeah, like I have no actual complaints about the quality of this song. I, I'm just like, I'm always like, ah, oh, but I, you know, bigger bigger thing. But I don't, I, I don't yeah. know really know how you follow Jake. Oh, James Bond's dead. Yeah. And then what I love then is that after the opening titles, it's like, no, he's still dead. Yeah. Like we, we see a <laughs> newspaper, uh, British naval commander murdered, right? Because of course, Bond, yeah. MI6 works under the purview of the Royal Navy. And so people in MI6 have naval ranks and Bond is technically a commander of the British Navy. It doesn't really come up in practice. Like I, if he wanted, I suppose he could go on to a naval ship and order people around but that's not you know it's not the realm in which he operates and so then we see someone watching him get a burial at sea in i guess hong kong harbor so he yeah he's given a burial at sea we well we we see a corpse in a wrapping under a union jack tipped into the ocean He's given his 21 gun salute and, and the person watching sort of confirms that this takes place upon landing at the or settling at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, a couple of divers approach and pick up this wrapped body and and swim it away, loading it into a submarine that's submerged in the harbor. They take it aboard the submarine. They they crack open the coating inside is is bond in full dress uniform with a breathing tank. They they pull the mouthpiece off him and he looks up and the captain is there and he asks permission to board come aboard captain and the captain grants him permission and uh, he steps up throws his naval hat on and uh, is summoned to M who is also apparently aboard. So he proceeds to M's ludicrous office aboard the, uh, the, the nuclear submarine. What a complicated and weird fake out. The fact that they also dressed him in his full dress uniform so that they could bury him at sea. When it's like, if anyone could see that he's in his uniform, then they know that he has a breathing apparatus. <laughs> like, 
what I think is even more fun, though, is, of course, he he proceeds to M's office. M has a fully outfitted office with like wood veneer panels and a giant wooden desk. But he mm-hmm. also there is a secretary's room, of course, that yeah. Money Penny inhabits, complete with hat rack and the whole jazz. But both Money Penny and M are also in uniform. Yeah, I thought this was really interesting. I I don't know why I never considered this. Of course, Bond being a naval commander, but of course. M is also, I assume, I, I guess, Admiral. I, I don't actually know. They don't say. And Money Penny is in the Wrens, the Women's Royal Naval Service, which I would have. I was like, oh, of course. Like she's not just she's not just a secretary. She works for MI6, so she's in the Wrens. Yeah. It amuses me that they've gone all in on like today is nautical themed day for <laughs> for all of the MI6 staff uh, because they're aboard a submarine. And of course, if you're aboard a submarine, you're, I guess, active duty and and expected to be in uniform along with everyone else. Anytime they have the MI6 satellite offices, I love it. Right. This is not the first <laughs> time or this is not the last time that they would do you know, M and Money Penny on location somewhere to meet with Bond. My favorite is in a future a future movie, but this is very good. That it's just like this complete he's got like a credenza and paintings on his wooden <laughs> walls. And the fact, yeah, the fact that there's a hat rack in Money Penny's office. So, you know, Bond gets to do his signature, fling the hat in and land on the hat rack, except it's it's his naval commander's hat. It's it's so yeah. it's so silly. It's so. just such an inefficient use of space on a submarine. <laughs> I know. Everything about this is just like that's so impractical, which is why it's great, to be clear. It's so good. None of this is a criticism. No, 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 no. It's it's like a highlight of the film. It's so silly. So M says, great. Well, now that people think you're dead, hopefully that'll get some people off your back. Because apparently through his first four movies, Bond's been making a bit of a name for himself in the international bad guy community. I can't imagine how. Yeah. All right. So Spectre's off his back. The people that are hunting him are off his back. Everybody thinks he's dead. So M now gives him his new assignment which is to go to Japan to meet up with a contact in Japan, the director of Japanese Secret Service, to basically see if he can figure out what the deal is with this missing spaceship and to do it quickly enough that not only is the American launch not interfered with, but there is going to be a subsequent Soviet launch or an an intervening Soviet launch that they also want to make sure is not interfered with. So... He's given basically a timeline. It's like, you need to get to Japan. You need to figure out what's going on. We have set up your first point of contact and, you know, carry the ball from there. We will be inserting you ASAP. A brief thing that I love in this scene is M gets up, walks over to his like credenza in this submarine office, opens a drawer in which for some reason he's kept a small piece of paper with an address on it. Why that wasn't already at his desk, I don't know. And he says, <laughs> go to this address. Bond looks at the piece of paper and then sets it on fire, <laughs> right? And it's like, you're, you're in a secure location. You could just give it back to M. Surely you shouldn't be lighting things on fire in a submarine. <laughs> Surely. <laughs> and on his way out, Money Penny gives him the code phrase to know that he's talking to a friend, which is, "That's right. I love you. Because she said he, she said she wanted it to be something that he would remember, and she's like, "It's I love you," and he's like, "Okay," and she says, "Okay, now say it back to me," and he's like, "It's okay, <laughs> I remember," and leaves. <laughs> Don't worry, you got it. Yeah, the ongoing money penny trying to get James Bond to give her the time of day. Yeah, thing which is it's to me it's played obviously there's problems with it but to me the way that lois maxwell plays it is always very playful and not actually fawning like obviously she likes james a lot but it comes across to me by how she portrays it that she's not actually fawning over james bond more that it's a fun game that they play yeah i i get the feeling that if circumstances were different either one of them would totally go for it Right. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, they they both feel like they're like they're into it, but it does feel like a very playful, very. And you're right. It's it's entirely down to Lois Maxwell's performance, but it is very much like it's banter and Mm -hmm. they they clearly like there's an attraction there, but they're both into it. They're both having like they're both having a good time playing it up at each other's expense. Yeah. That presentation varies a little bit from film to film, but it it. 
by and large always comes across as like they both know what's going on and the the power dynamics have been dealt with in a way that they're both having fun yeah and this would get of course totally flipped in i think golden eye was the first one with i don't recall the actress's name offhand but who plays money penny in that movie where james is like laying it on really thick and she's the one who's like nah you don't you don't get this right so it's right. you know it's interesting that they would that was that was part of a whole uh the redemption of the james bond character in 1995 mm-hmm. but anyway in this instance james bond gets put in the torpedo tube and and shot at japan which is presumably an act of war <laughs> So I I had a laugh at this because as I was watching this, I remembered this scene. I was like, oh, right. Of course, he gets shot by torpedo, except that he doesn't get shot by torpedo. Like, no, there's nothing actually propelling him out of the torpedo tube here. That was what got me. It's like he gets in and it makes a like shoo sound. And he clearly is launched out of the front of the torpedo tube. But there's not like any propellant. No, he goes about 20 feet and then swims the rest of the way. Yeah. With no tank. He's loaded in, of course, just like holding his breath, which seems problematic. But anyhow, he makes his way ashore. Great montage establishing shots of... Oh, it's so good. 1960s Tokyo neon signs. It's just so cool looking. What's amazing is that with precious little exceptions, mostly the cars, all of these exterior establishing shots of Bond walking around Tokyo you could still film it today. Wow. The way that people dress and the fact, you know, like the bicycles and the signage and everything, the differences are that people would be driving, you know, weird looking Daihatsu cars and they'd all have cell phones. But apart from that, there's like shot with someone driving a rickshaw. That still happens. There's women dressed in yukata. That still happens. Like it's really interesting to see this slice of Tokyo in 1967. Yeah, I guess in Tokyo specifically, you would notice a lot more forward fashions depending on the district of the town you're in. But right. generally speaking, people in Japan dress very, very nicely with very plain colors and just like just really nice clothes. Speaking of really nice clothes, I really like Bond's suit in this movie. He has got just a like a mid gray two piece, two button suit that he's wearing with a white shirt. It's not it. I don't think it's a knit tie. I think it's a silk, like a patterned silk tie, but it's just a, like a plain navy blue tie. Mm-hmm. Ugh, I aspire. <laughs> it's a good look <laughs> to yeah. have a suit that well fitted it. I need to gush over it a little bit. It, it is possibly my favorite Bond look is just the like Sean Connery's 1960s era slim fitted mid gray suit white shirt navy blue tie his outfitting through the past three movies well the past four movies has been great all along i think the fashions of james bond in the connery era i don't think there has been another era of james bond where the fashion applied to james bond has been as iconic or as well that's not quite true has been as timeless and as classy i think bond always looks impeccable in the Connery era and it it has they have not managed to do that as well from at least from a modern perspective until they got to Daniel Craig because like when we get to Roger Moore it's all double-breasted suits that make him look like a box <laughs> it i mean Roger Moore is around for a while so that does vary a bit but it's all like from the minute he starts it's like double-breasted suits all the way down Mm -hmm. it's very rare that he's in anything else and it like stylistically for the time yeah but now it looks really dated similarly like the 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 brosnan era is not as bad but there was just a tendency towards really boxy suits in that era so nothing he wears is like as iconically beautiful to a modern Mm. eye but that like 60s suit mm, mm. (laughs) <laughs> and then, of course, they have re- they basically recreated that suit with Daniel Craig now because he also wears a mid gray suit with a white shirt and a, a navy blue tie. But his is even more ludicrously tight fitted because that is what the style has been since Daniel Craig has been Bond. And also Daniel Craig is ripped like no one else. So yeah. they they take advantage of that to show it off. 
Anyway, that that was my digression down the path of James Bond suits, but he happens to be wearing the mid gray suit in this scene and for the next several subsequent scenes. And I just I love it. It's it's very pretty. So anyhow, he goes to the location that he's been given. His his goal is to meet Henderson, who is the uh, the MI6 operative in Tokyo. I don't think he's actually an operative. I think he's just a contact. Oh, he could be a, he could be a contact. Yeah, like he's he's obviously friendly with MI6, but I don't think he I don't know if he actually works for them. I'm not entirely sure. But on the way yeah. to this address that he has memorized, Bond is spotted by several women in traditional garb who take out their clutch purses which are also radios and whisper into them in Japanese which is not subtitled or anything and it's just sort of assumed that someone is keeping tabs on him but you're not entirely sure who so he arrives and the location he arrives at is none other than a sumo wrestling arena he he goes in and he meets one of the wrestlers and it's like you know i was told to come to this address i i believe i meant to speak to you and and the the rest was like yeah yeah we've got your ticket here take it and i'll show you your seat and so he like brings him up to his seat uh and he sits down and there's an empty seat next to him and a, a sumo match begins moments later a uh youngish japanese woman sits down next to him they both sort of intently watch the match until bond sort of works up the the nerve to deliver the code word because he of course is expecting henderson to have been here so he he leans over and says i love you to which the woman responds saying like hey okay i know where your i know where your contact is i've been sent to pick you up i will take you to him and and bond is like well why didn't he come himself she's like he didn't say bond is understandably suspicious of this i want to say also this cinematography in this scene is so great this huge sumo arena full of people and according to the director the wrestlers were not interested in doing a theatrical performance of a sumo match so they just put cameras on them and were like okay i guess have a match then so this is a legitimate (laughs) sumo contest between these two because they were like, no, you're not going to tell us who's going to win this. That's not how we do this. And so they were right. like, okay, sure, fine. So essentially they, they wait for the match to conclude and then both stand up and make their exit from the arena. I think at this point we have been introduced by name. So we, we learn that the, the person that we're speaking to is Aki mm-hmm. and she takes Bond to Henderson's home and Bond goes in and meets Henderson. Henderson is walking with a cane bond in an attempt to validate henderson's identity grabs the cane from him and uses it to smack his wooden his leg which is of course makes a loud thwack as it's a wooden leg we are sort of given to understand that bond had been told that this was a characteristic of henderson prior to this mm-hmm. although we don't learn this so it, it it looks to the viewer like bond just grabs his cane and whacks him in the leg henderson responds i'm glad you got the right one and then yeah. confirms confirms that he lost it in uh, in the war. Yeah, and then Bond puts his gun away and is like, okay. Because, you know, Bond's sort of on edge, right? So he's like, he pulls the gun on him until he takes the cane and then hits him in the leg and is like, okay, I'm convinced that this is actually the guy that I meant to be talking to. Henderson chats with Bond for a while and they sure. this sort of chat about the spaceship that has been capturing other spaceships. Henderson claims that he has some evidence relating to this. And then sort of like halfway through the conversation just stops talking with his back to a wall and it takes bond a moment to realize that something is wrong and then he runs over to henderson and pulls him forward only to find there's a knife in henderson's back that's been plunged into him through the the paper wall behind him killing him and preventing him from spilling any further beans what a great bit like just just a great visual of him just freezing mid-sentence and then you know knife through the shoji screen is just it's it's a very cool thing there's another little fun moment in this scene where henderson gives him a vodka martini and says here it is it's a uh, stirred not shaken that was it right and bond out of courtesy goes yes thank you <laughs> you know I, <laughs> I i i just like that bond's not going to be a wiener about it you know yeah. he's like yes great thank you you know he's he's not going to correct him but yeah. he recognizes fact, that he made the effort 
Yeah, in fact, goes on to compliment him on his choice of uh, Russian vodka, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, Russian just, vodka. Yeah, specifically Russian vodka. So Bond just bursts through the wall like like the Kool-Aid man. And he, he chases down the assailant, ends up sort of catching up with him in the, the, like the garden out front. The assailant is wearing uh, a mask. He's wearing like a surgical or like a, a health mask, basically. And it's like a trench coat and a hat. And uh, Bond, of course, is barefoot. Well, he's wearing his socks at this point. So anyhow, he, they get into a fight and Bond, Bond kills the assailant and proceeds to take advantage of, of his clothing by like stripping his jacket and his shoes and his mask and his hat off. And he puts the mask on, bundles himself up in the jacket, puts the hat on, tips his head down and approaches the getaway driver who's waiting at the base of a hill in a car and he pretends to be injured so he he like wa- sort of hobbles up to the car making uh, uh, sounds the getaway driver loads him into the back of the car where he sort of crumples into the back seat to protect his, uh, his identity getaway driver drives him away arriving at a an office building the headquarters of osato chemicals before we leave mr henderson completely in the dust as of course he does not reappear i just wanted to mention that he's played by actor charles gray who would return to the bond franchise merely two movies later in diamonds are forever playing blofeld which is really weird to because it's <laughs> he doesn't look any different he's just the same guy and so it's it's that's not meant to be a thing it's not like oh it's secretly you know that henderson no it's just the same actor they were like that guy's great we should have him play blofeld (laughs) so like okay and yeah yeah. anyway i just thought that it was confusing for me the first time i saw this because i was like wait a minute i i've seen this guy in a different bond film a similar thing will happen in the future actually when we get there (laughs) between the movies the living daylights and goldeneye the the actor who plays like the, one of the main bad guys in in the living daylights will end up playing bond cia contact in goldeneye very strange <laughs> which also is very strange because again it's two movies apart so back to osato chemicals which was filmed by the way at hotel new otani in tokyo we arrive at, at osato chemicals and the driver <laughs> hefts bond up onto his shoulder and like fireman carries him into this giant office he drops him on the couch at which point bond tips up his hat revealing that he's not who the the getaway driver thought he was and and a fight scene takes place all around this office as as the getaway driver is trying to subdue bond and bond is trying to subdue the getaway driver so that uh, so that he can you know, figure out what's going on. And they bust this office up pretty bad. Like there are decorative statues that get smashed and furniture gets thrown all over the place. The getaway driver is a pretty big guy. Like he's 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 another in the sort of long, long line of henchmen that seems impervious to damage. He's not the not even the only one in this film, but he like he's just a big guy who can take a lot of punches and takes a lot of effort to take down. You may already know this, but the actor portraying this henchman is credited as Peter Fanin Maivia, who is not Japanese. He's Samoan, uh, which is not to say that Japanese businessmen can't have a Samoan bodyguard. In fact, it's probably a good idea. This actor is also known as his professional wrestling name, High Chief Peter Maivia, who most people will know as the grandfather of The Rock. That's awesome. I didn't know that. I yeah. mean, I like I am not a professional wrestle person. So I I have not gone deep in terms of my knowledge of that, but that's that's awesome. Yeah, uh, Rocky Johnson is his son-in-law and uh, Rocky Johnson is 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 The Rock's dad. So yeah, High Chief Peter Maivia is grandfather of Rock the Dwayne Johnson. And huh. as unsurprisingly did all his own stunts in this scene, which I think is one of yeah. the reasons why this fight scene looks so good. <laughs> yeah, it's a sweet fight. So there's a sweet fight and the getaway driver is subdued. Yeah, but it's a it's a very good scene in an amazing set. This set is incredible. Uh, so with the henchman dealt with, Bond starts to snoop around. He finds this 
there's a cabinet in the wall. And so he goes over to the cabinet. Well, he opens the cabinet and reveals that it's like a mini bar, right? Like they were in an executive's office. And of course, every executive bond movies have taught me nothing. It's that every government official and every business executive has their own mini bar built into a wall in their office. Anyway, he opens it up and there's this giant mini bar with like a fridge and like a well-stocked bar. And so he drags the henchman into the mini bar and sort of like pushes him in so that he can close the door and, and, and hide him and then pours himself a drink from the mini bar proceeding to pour himself a drink and then go basically blah as he drinks it. <laughs> and and looks at the the supply of liquor that he has just raided and remarks on the fact that the bar has been stocked with i think he says "Ugh, siamese vodka at the time <laughs> what a weirdly specific gripe to have it is it's the most bizarre gripe i like i mean it it's a like a comic relief moment in the scene it also is sort mm-hmm. of a callback to the like the russian vodka right like yeah these happen five minutes apart but it's another like it's another one of those scenes where like bond makes his life more difficult by doing something bondian where he like shoves the guy in the cabinet but then can't help but pour himself a drink as he's about to go futz around in this office so anyhow he he closes him into the the mini bar then proceeds to sort of like shuffle around. He finds a safe. And so he, he starts to crack the safe with a little gadget that he has with him that helps him crack the safe. And as he's cracking the safe, there are some security guards walking down the hall. So we have a great little tense scene where bond is trying to quietly crack this safe and he can hear the footsteps coming down the hall and he starts to sweat as he's like, I got to do this before the, the footsteps come. And then, then the guards stop sort of halfway up the hall. Cause there's no apparent cause for alarm and they start to walk away and he, he finishes unlocking the safe. He, you know, he, he turns the dial to the last number and opens the safe and an alarm goes off. <laughs> so he just grabs whatever isn't pinned down in the safe. There, you can see there's like dollar bills and whatever in there, but he just grabs the documents that he can find from the safe, proceeds to make a run for it with the security guards like shooting at him from behind. And, and he makes a run to the elevator and he gets into the elevator and out the front door. He gets out of the building and, and runs into the parking lot where he's picked up by Aki. They have some back and forth where Bond is not really sure he trusts her yet. And she is obviously sort of like she knows more than she's letting on. And she drives to a subway station and then bolts out of the car. The car, by the way, I have to talk about this. This is a Toyota 2000 GT, which Wikipedia describes as a limited production front engine, rear wheel drive, two seat hard top coupe grand tourer (laughs) designed by Toyota in collaboration with Yamaha. Just a gorgeous little car. Now. They never made a convertible version of the 2000 DT, and yet you'll notice that many of them appear in this movie without roofs. They they were not turned into convertibles. This was not any sort of special variant that was created just for this movie or whatever. They just took the roofs off. They were not converted. They were not replaced with a soft top. You know, there was no sort of like fancy. They just cut the roofs completely off because Sean Connery's <laughs> too tall. Ah. Sean Connery's six foot two and he couldn't fit in the car. The cars are so small on the inside that he would have looked stupid and it would have been awkward to film in. So they were just like, all right, we'll just take the roofs off completely. And the thing <laughs> is they look great as a convertible, but they, they were never, there was never a convertible variant. That's amazing. I, I assumed yeah. it was something like they had taken it off because it was awkward to film in. But just like, yeah. no, Connery couldn't fit. That's even better. Interesting and like random trivia courtesy of IMDb. This is the only James Bond movie in the Aeon Productions ones where Bond does not get behind the wheel of a car. He's he's driven around in a lot of cars. He drives a weird gyrocopter later on, but he never actually drives a car himself in this movie, and it's the only one. Ah. Huh. Yeah. He dives out of this one to pursue Aki as she runs into a abandoned slash closed subway station. She like closes the shutter behind her and like just bolts. She's being very evasive on this whole car ride. He's like, okay, this is weird. Who are you? How did you know I was there? what's going on? And she's like, well, I guess we'll find out. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like it's very like. Mm-hmm. At this point, I think it's well established. Bond has good reason to be suspicious of pickup drivers. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> and uh, she is not giving him any reason to trust her. But yeah, he, she runs into this station and, and he follows her. There comes a point where she stops and turns around. Basically, like Bond is like, oh, OK, I've caught you and uh, goes to walk up to her. And then she smiles and the floor falls out from under him. And he rides a like a chute, basically down and is dropped into a reclining chair in another great office set. We learn that he has he has dropped into the office of the head of the Japanese Secret Service, Tiger Tanaka, who is mentioned earlier by Henderson. He says that, you know, it's Mr. Tanaka. His friends call him Tiger. He's going to be the guy that we're going to put you in contact with. And then Henderson is killed before he can say anything else. And mm-hmm. then, yeah, this this elaborate slip and slide into a another amazing set with these two spherical televisions and just this cool concrete construction how far underground must this be if they're already down in a subway station and then he slides down uh, again Uh and it's like a long slide it is and then yeah eventually tiger doesn't reveal who he is initially and then he introduces himself and then bond's like really well then how do you feel about me and then he's he responds I love you. And so then, <laughs> then, then Bond knows that he's like, okay, great. Here's some papers I got from Asato's place. You gotta, you gotta look into these. Like, <laughs> you know, I just yeah. love that as soon as the code phrase is there, he's like, okay, sweet. We look, we got to work on this. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's never been betrayed by a code phrase before. So anyhow, we learn some things over the course of this, like this scene and the next set of scenes, we learn that on the documents, there's a photograph of a cargo ship. The cargo ship is named the Ningpo. There is a micro dot message on the photograph. The micro dot says that the tourist who took the photo was liquidated as a, like as a security precaution the, the two basically get their information. Tanaka invites Bond back to his home. They basically walk to Tanaka's private subway car and they get on the subway car. And he's like, I never travel at street level as a, as a person in my position. That would be very unwise. Uh, so he gets onto the, the private subway car and they, they travel to. Which, which also looks gorgeous. It's all decked out in wood. Yeah. Very, very luxurious. Bond does the whole like, I'm down with the locals thing as as Tiger offers him a drink and he's like, would you like, you know, would you would you like a drink, a vodka martini, perhaps? And uh, Bond is like, no, no, sake is fine. I'll, I'll take sake because Tiger's having a, a drink of sake. And uh, then he like has a sip and then he's like, oh, I I especially like sake when it's served at the right temperature of 74.2 degrees. 97.3 degrees Fahrenheit. That's right. That's right. He's so specific about it. And it's like, you don't need to tell Tiger that he knows this. He's Japanese, right? It's like, (laughs) yeah, especially like when it, you know, it's like, especially like when it's served at the correct temperature of this, it's just like telling the person who's from the place a hyper specific thing just to prove that you know it is just like, Okay, you, you you could have just said the correct temperature, and that would yeah. have been fine. But again, this is for yeah. the benefit of the audience, so they can be like, yeah. "Oh, pe- people in Japan drink hot alcohol. What's up with that?" Yeah, there. I mean, there's there's a non-zero amount of like, Japan is very different in this movie. Yeah, Roald Dahl's criticism of the book is largely sidestepped, but there is a bit of like. Hey, check out Japan. Particularly, the I think the most egregious is in the next scene because they they one hundred percent they figure out that they need to look into this thing because they see some of the in the picture they see as well as this boat they see some diving girls or AKA ama which they're abalone fishermen they who free dive looking for abalone in a bunch of more rural coastal places in Japan. So they're going to try and pinpoint that. So they go back to Tiger's place and he's like, Hey Bond, come over here to the, to my like private onsen, which by the way is again, just an astonishing set. It's this amazing, like modern take on a traditional Japanese interior 
you know, like there's, it's like a tiled floor, but then there's these stone onsens inset. It's really cool. And then these four women in bikinis come in and take off Bond and Tiger's yukata and start giving them, you know, like a wash and everything. And Tiger just apropos of nothing just seems to just states like in Japan, men come first and women come second you wouldn't get this kind of service back home haha or something weird and it's right it's just it's first of all it's not necessarily inaccurate japan for a very very long time has held fairly conservative views about the role of women among many other conservative views that they hold as a society it certainly politically if you look at how they vote but it's a very clunky thing to say to just for a character to just volunteer. And it's really it's a whole thing. It just feels gross. Oh, yeah. It's one of those things where it's like, what's that? The 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 Marge Simpson meme of like, well, he's not wrong, but he didn't have to say it. Yeah, a little bit like uh, the whole scene is is like very like it opens with uh, tiger being like you're about to have the most civil or the first civilized bath of your life and then and then the women walk in and i have to admit i like this quip i like this quip a lot if the scene ended there it would be a much better scene but bond responds upon seeing the women walk in well i surely like the plumbing (laughs) i forgot about that and it's like it's a it's a gross sexist joke but it's it's it like it's so james bond i i like that joke despite myself but then the scene goes on the women start scrubbing them down and tanaka's like i bet your english woman w- women wouldn't give you this kind of service and bond is like oh i know one or two who might and, and like and it the scene just goes on <laughs> Anyhow, then then Tiger makes Bond pick one of the women to, like, give him a, a massage and, you know, other things. And Bond picks one and, and he responds like, ah, yes, good choice. She's very sexiful. <laughs> and then she takes him away and she starts giving him a massage. And at that point, Aki sneaks in, who at this point has, like, developed a bit of a like at, at least a rapport with Bond and she takes over the massage. And when Bond looks up and realizes that it's Aki, they have a moment and she basically like encourages him like in a, in a much less exploitative way in a much more like they're operating as equals way, which mercifully she sort of like seduces him to bed. Yeah. What a, what a refreshing change of pace following Thunderball. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So anyhow, she she then cracks a joke on the way to bed being like, oh, I think I'm really going to enjoy enjoy serving under you. And then like go <laughs> like goes into to smooch him. And then, you know, they go at it. The like Aki taking the lead there basically salvages the scene into something that's not not just <laughs> crapping on women irredeemable all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, the next day. Bond goes back to Osato Chemicals to meet Mr. Osato himself. Uh, so he poses as what is the name of the company? Something Exports. Oh, Universal uh, Exports. Universal Exports. He his sort of like cover story, of course. What is the name he gives in this case? It is Mr. Mr. Fisher. Fisher. Mr. Fisher of Universal Exports. That's right. He goes to meet with Mr. Osato, posing as a buyer of the the chemicals that osato chemicals makes osato sort of like agrees to meet him upon entering osato's office discovers that in the the few hours since he had been there last the entire office has been restored back to appear like nothing ever happened and there's a really small moment about that that i love because the he's being watched on cameras the entire time while he's milling around the office waiting for Mr. Osato to come in. And there's a moment where he goes over and looks at one of the statues that had been broken in half during the fight with the henchman. And he inspects this statue. And because he's looking at this statue that was broken, there's a shot of the guy watching him on camera who then smirks because it's just like, a, ah, got you. Because mm-hmm. Bond is looking at 
he's basically looking for like where the brake line is. He's like, how did they fix this so quickly? And the guy on camera is like, ah, you, no one else should know that that was broken. That's got him, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, it, it's a very small moment that I really like much more. Obviously after he sits down with Osato, <laughs> Osato's desk has like an x-ray scanner in the front of it. <laughs> and Osato's like looking at the fact that bond is strapped. Like he's got a gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I, I guess I'm getting ahead because Osato comes in via helicopter to his balcony helipad. That's right, and uh, in, like he introduces himself, he introduces his his secretary as well, Helga Brandt. Uh, then you know receives Bond. He offers him a drink, and goes over to the mini bar, or it, it may be Miss Brandt that goes mm-hmm. over to the mini bar to, to like prepare the drink as uh, as Osato sitting at his desk and you can see Bond sort of suspiciously eyeing the door of the the mini bar as she goes to open it and then the like the henchman is gone he's just not there mm-hmm. Sato of course sees that Bond has a gun so they they talk about business for a little bit up to a point where Osato basically you know says you know I think you're taking an unnecessary risk here and and basically shows him the door he's like you know you we we will not have business essentially i i I don't want to pursue this deal and sends him on his way and as soon as bond leaves he he turns to to ms brant and is just like kill him yeah it's 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 really casual he's just like okay yeah kill that guy like it's just like (laughs) (laughs) which by the way apparently they're going to accomplish by just a guy with a tommy gun directly out front of the building it almost works yeah <laughs> it's the only reason it doesn't work is because aki pulls up and is like yo get in the car <laughs> but he's d- directly outside osato chemical and the guy rolling up with a tommy gun very slowly <laughs> in the world's slowest drive-by shooting yeah <laughs> so then we get to have a great car chase through the very narrow streets of tokyo while they're barreling through tokyo Aki gets on the radio to Tiger and says, you know, hey, we're being chased. I'm going to drive down to this highway. Can you arrange the, you know, the the usual welcome or whatever it is that, that she says, you know, some sort of some sort of code phrase. They get to a little bit more rural, a little out of town, still being chased and enormous helicopter like a sea king. It looks like. Yeah. If I don't know if anyone outside of canada knows what a sea king is but it's like our coast guard it's like a dual prop coast guard helicopter it's the one i'm the one i'm thinking of anyway you know not the pokemon sea king (laughs) it's like uh, it's got (laughs) it's got dual rotors at the front and back of and you know don't worry about it anyway an an enormous helicopter (laughs) pulls up behind lowers a giant magnet like we saw in goldfinger at the auto wreckers yard picks up like latches onto the roof of the car that's chasing them and they do this for real too this is not done with miniatures and then Uh lifts the car up off the road and carries it away it's amazing it doesn't just carry it away go carries it away and dumps it in tokyo harbor yeah carries it basically out to sea (laughs) and then drops it from the sky it's so good it's just like all right that's taking care of those guys the shots for this one are really like it, it, this is a really good scene it, like big wide shots of this helicopter just like releasing <laughs> the car and the the henchmen within to their their ultimate doom like this is again a really fun really like silly james bondy thing to have happen but like i love the way this scene is shot just before we move on to the next scene i looked it up on the internet movie plane database which is a website i have literally just discovered (laughs) i am (laughs) pd i am pdb i am pdb.org you are absolutely correct all right and they list every flying contraption in this whole movie and that is the kawasaki vertol kv 1072 aka the boeing vertol ch46 c knight ah which is indeed the same model of aircraft that the canadian coast guard used all right yeah, not, cool. not the sea king my bad the sea king is a much more traditional looking helicopter but no the sea knight is the dual rotor thing the u.s marine corps uses it too so there you go cool 
Okay, so when last we left Bond and Aki, they were on the road out of Tokyo, and uh, they were headed towards Kobe, where the Ningpo was docked. So they, they head there, they end up at the Osato Chemicals dock, basically, mm-hmm. and as they're sort of snooping around, they discover that the ship is transporting liquid oxygen. So one of the things that, that they discover in uh, Bond's conversation with Tiger is that like the the manifest for what is aboard the Ningpo is food supplies, right? Mm-hmm. Like rice and and other things. And one of the things that they they have listed is locks, like so many barrels of locks, basically. And Tanaka's like, oh, what is what is locks? And he's like, well, it's smoked salmon, but it's also the abbreviated form of liquid oxygen. And uh, then as they're snooping around at the docks, he finds a bunch of tanks that are listed as giant pill shaped capsules of synthetic turpentine. That's right. Yeah. So so they've got these giant capsules of synthetic turpentine. But Bond notes that they are perspiring, that they have condensation on them, which implies that, you know, turpentine doesn't condense uh, or, you know, is not at a different temperature when liquid than the surrounding air and so he's like all right this is clearly liquid oxygen that is in these and it is it is shipping rocket fuel supplies so i think we've got our lead at that point a bunch of like goons come out of the the shadows <laughs> and like what are you doing here and he's like oh you know i i'm just walking around and they basically attack him he tells aki to get away to tell tiger what they found and he proceeds to you know have it out with with all the dock workers yeah japan has longshoremen too and they're just as angry (laughs) and that like this again is a really great fight scene like the the, most of it is just sort of like the bond being chased around the docks but there's one really awesome shot i love it i i had forgotten that it's in it but it's so good of bond running across a rooftop as like all the dock workers swarm him and and the camera like starts in you know it's it's a wide-ish shot but it starts in quite close and just pulls out to reveal more and more of the roof as bond like runs across this rooftop and more and more workers start to swarm him and he like gets in a fight and like punches one guy and he goes down and you can see like eight other guys like running across the roof behind him ah it's such a good shot. It's a great shot. It's it's almost 30 seconds long of just this unbroken helicopter shot from a distance. And it's such a cool take on one of these scenes. I saw there was an interview with the director, Louis Gilbert, who was just like, these rooftops just looked so cool. And we were out there with the helicopter and they've been doing all this work. And I thought, what if we just try to shoot it like this? And it's such a unique thing. And I'm really glad that, that they did it because it, it's, it's such a cool looking shot. You know, now... We're starting to get more into creative cinematography. Not that the cinematography in the early movies has ever been bad, but it's been very utilitarian. It's been very sort of like, you know, we know how to shoot a scene like this, you know. And over the course of the rest of these movies, especially, particularly in the last several years to when we were recording this, the cinematography does get more and more interesting and creative, but uh, this one's mm. particularly good. Okay, so Bond runs across the the roof and and escapes by essentially hurling himself off two sort of like vaulted levels of roofing. He he jumps off the roof, does a flip in midair, lands on a bunch of boxes, then does it again, landing on a subsequent bunch of boxes, which puts him down at the water level and uh, away from all the dock workers that were chasing him. And uh, he begins to to walk away, adjusting his suit cuffs because he's become a little rumpled over the course of this chase, only to be accosted one final time and rendered unconscious. Osato appears and is like, OK, take this guy away. I don't know why he doesn't just kill him now, because he said to kill him earlier. It, it, it becomes evident momentarily that he took him away because they wanted information. I do think this particular section of the movie is like, I don't know, really know to what end this is serving but yeah 
He regains consciousness under the observation of Ms. Brandt. Ms. Brandt jumps pretty immediately to sultry yet threatening. <laughs> yeah, she's in there like a shot. Yeah, she she goes over to a drawer. Like, she's talking to Bond, and she goes over to a drawer in a cabinet and opens it to a an array of surgical tools. And she pulls out a blade and walks over to Bond and is like, do you know what this is? He, he quips something in response. And she's like, well plastic surge or i think it's like i'd rather not and she's like plastic surgeons use it to remove pieces of skin but hopefully we won't have to use it if you just tell me what i want to know and she tucks it into his pocket bond basically th- there's like a fun little play off of each other here over the next scene you're right that it doesn't achieve much in the grand scheme of the movie but it's at least like a fun little back and forth and subversion of expectations mm-hmm. because bond then immediately starts putting on the charm He's like, I am going to woo this woman and she is going to let me go. And so he basically offers to buy her out and is like, listen, we can we can pay you whatever it is you're making here, plus more if you just give up Osato. And and she's like, well, if I if I do that, they'll kill me. And he's like, I can get I can have you out of the country tonight. Just let me go. She sort of like plays along with it and, you know, is like, oh, okay, you you make a compelling argument. So compelling, in fact, that I'm going to sleep with you right now. She releases him from the chair and they go and do a sex. How dare James Bond do another thing where he simply has sex with a woman and she turns to the side of good. I'm so performatively mad, Matt. (laughs) No doubt. So then we cut to the next scene. (laughs) <laughs> they're in a plane all of a sudden. Or they're in a plane and Ms. Brandt is flying the plane and Bond is in the back seat. They have a little more conversation. She's still sort of going along with the plan of like how they're going to get out of the like, oh, OK, I've, I've rescued you from the docks. How are you going to get me out of the country? And uh, like Bond starts sort of talking about his plan. And then she's like, yeah, fooled you and traps him in the back seat as a little like wooden plank shoots out, trapping him in the seat, unable to move his arms. And she puts on a helmet and goggles and bails out. Yep. She just parachutes out of the plane. She opens the hatch and dives. This leaves Bond now, of course, trapped in the back seat of an uncontrolled plane that is rapidly going into a dive. So he fights and fusses with it until he manages to work one arm free and then breaks the the plank the little tray table that's holding him in place with another one of the uh the sort of like austin powers classic judo chops and manages to sort of recover control of the plane with enough time to set the the plane down without blowing it up or crashing or dying man like he lands it and then gets away just in time for the plane to explode it's a very very silly stunt but all right cool yeah yeah so one thing that we skipped over at a previous point so bond asked aki to tell tanaka to contact mi6 and send he says please send little nelly and suggest that she be accompanied by her father yeah And so at this point, we essentially cut to Q shows up. Yeah, we cut back to Tiger's place. They they talk about how the there's another launch going to be happening sooner than planned. And there's no information about where the spaceship. Remember, it's about a spaceship could have come down. Yeah. And oh, also Q is here. They show Bond some pictures of the Ningpo. And overnight, the water line on the ship has changed, meaning that it's com- become completely unloaded now. And so they're like, well, where did all this liquid oxygen go? This doesn't make any sense. Like, there's nowhere around here. Like, what the, that, you know, what's going on? Okay, well, here's Q. Q has merely one gadget, this movie. But what a gadget it is. It's it's spread across four suitcases. And yeah, I actually, I love that they, the way this is edited is that it's sort of like this montage of this tiny single seat gyrocopter plane and auto gyro being put together under under narration as they talk about like wait what is this what's going on here like oh well it's this thing as we see like clang bick bomb chunk conk trick like all these sound effects as it cuts between different stages of the of the 
plane being put together. And uh, so upon being being completed, Q, of course, gives us the walk around. It's like this is an auto gyro. It has an array of weaponry. So it has rocket launchers, each with six rockets on either side of the front. It's got Mm -hmm. dual forward firing machine guns synchronized to 100 meters. It has two air to air heat seeking missiles. Again, forward firing. Then on the back, it has two smoke emitters for a smoke screen, two flamethrowers with an 80 meter range. <laughs> this aircraft, the Wallace WA-116, developed by former Royal Air Force Wing Commander Ken Wallace, W-A-L-L-I-S, was discovered basically by the producers listening to an interview with him on the BBC. And or it might have been Ken Adam, actually, production designer, listening to this and sort of looking into it and going, Oh, this this thing sounds great, calling him up and being like, Hey, can we use this for for james bond and it's sort of like well yeah but i mean i i have to fly it and they're like okay great pack it up meet us in japan in the, like two weeks <laughs> you know and so ken wallace who developed it and everything is the one doing all the all the flying apparently they did like 80 takeoffs to get all the all the various shots required for this wow it doesn't seem like it would have a lot of like range or flying time because it's like a, <laughs> it's like a lawnmower engine on this it's thing. It's very small. Yeah, more more behind the scenes info on on that coming up. But in the meantime, Bond gets inside and takes off. Yeah, so he, he throws on his little helmet and and goggles and hops in and takes off. And they like they have a little bit of information because they know that there's one area on the island that the the Ningpo like went into a cove but they lost and they lost sight of it but they have like they have no like there's nothing there right like they have no idea why it like how it would have unloaded or where it would have unloaded they just couldn't see it all night and of course like the US military has been doing surveillance photo like photography of Japan this entire time and they're like we have photographed the entire island there is nothing there and then they're like no we've re-photographed the entire island there's nothing there we've been we we get that message a couple of times over the course of the movies where it's like we cannot find anything with aerial photography there is nothing there so bond hops in this and and goes for a tour of the island basically to, to just do some aerial surveillance of his own and you know he flies over the island and there's nothing suspicious it's a volcanic island there's a volcanic crater there's ocean villages nothing weird at all then there's a great shot of little nelly's shadow over the land below and then suddenly four more bigger louder shadows approach from behind as uh as bond is received and intercepted by four attack helicopters these are the kawasaki bell 47 g3s I just have this page open now for the rest of the episode. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just never navigating away from IMPDB.org. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so yeah, now Bond gets to Bond gets to use all that, all the cool tools that Q had shown off, which of course are not part of the gyro normally. This is all added by special effects supervisor John Steers. It's great. This uh, th- this is a, this is one of those like action scenes that is totally gratuitous to the film. It is like it's super fun. Like it's it's just fun. It's like an aerial battle of this little auto gyro against four helicopters, and the 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 helicopters, of course, all have like machine guns and are shooting at it. And the tail of the auto gyro gets shot up, and Bond gets to, you know we get some fun like stunt flying. And we get to see all of the various thing, like all of the various gadgets on Little Nelly used as one gets taken out by heat seeking missile and one gets taken out by rocket launches and one gets taken out by flamethrower. And oh, aerial mines. That was the other thing I forgot was aerial mines, Mm -hmm. which uh, Q is like, remember, you have to be above your target in order to use them. And it's literally a bunch of little explosives on tiny parachutes that he drops on a helicopter and blows it up. The the reason I say this fight scene is totally gratuitous is, of course, if the helicopters hadn't attacked Bond, he would have no idea if he was looking in the right place. It's only because they attack that he is 
able to confirm that there's something suspicious about this island in the first place. Footage from this sequence was shot many months and hundreds of miles apart for a couple different reasons. One, not amazing, which was that they were dealing with a lot of weird because they're they've got the the auto gyro the four bell helicopters and their camera helicopter all in a fairly tight airspace with an incredibly skilled aerial cameraman john jordan doing the cinematography and dealing with weird sudden updrafts and stuff had been sort of plaguing this shoot for quite a while and then one particularly bad updraft pushed one of the bell helicopters up into the bottom of the camera helicopter the rotors taking off one of the skids on the camera helicopter and thereby most of john jordan's foot cool so they landed in a real hurry they were very near a apparently an international surgeons convention which was lucky and they were able to unfortunately not a hundred percent successfully reattach his foot and later back in England, apparently under just the best care that Saltzman and Broccoli could possibly pay for, John Jordan opted to actually have the lower part of his leg just removed entirely because the the surgery to reattach the foot did not work and he was in such pain. And he would return to the Bond franchise later for other movies to keep shooting aerial photography just with a prosthetic leg because doing aerial photography was this man's passion. But yeah, pretty pretty grisly. So that stopped filming of this sequence for several months. Also, the climax of the scene when Bond starts, you know, killing the helicopters involved a lot of explosions and they were filming over a national park in Japan. And Japan was like, no, you're absolutely not. And so they found some areas near Torremolinos in Spain that the mountains looked close enough that they were like, okay, well, you know, and Spain didn't mind if they <laughs> crashed helicopters there. So they finished shooting the sequences over in uh, Torremolinos. And obviously all the shots of Sean Connery are done with rear projection. Right. What follows this scene I really like is the entire pre-title, not the entire pre-title, but the half of the pre-title sequence with the American spacecraft going up in space and the Spectre ship. We don't know that yet. I guess we do sort of know that yet because I think I think we have learned that that it is Spectre because I think we've learned that Brandt is number 11 at this point. It doesn't matter. It's a Spectre ship. Spoilers. Yeah. We're about to get there anyhow. (laughs) With them coming up behind and opening up and swallowing them. You know, we've seen that whole scene. And now we see that whole thing again with the Russians because they're launching their thing. And this entire scene is entirely in Russian. There's no subtitles. There's no dubbing. But we know everything that's happening because we've seen it once before. So we just get to watch the whole thing again, but in Russian. And I I just kind of like that. That's like, well, we've seen what's happening. So we know... We don't need to have it explained to us in English, but we're just seeing it happen to the Russians as well. And now we get a little bit more context because we do actually then see the Spectre ship land in the biggest goddamn set. Holy crap. This, what an amazing, amazing set. Yeah. Apparently this set, they built it outside in an empty lot near Pinewood Studios. It could be seen for like three miles. This set, just this set, cost a million dollars. I believe it. Which is the entire budget of Dr. No. I, I believe it. Apparently, Ken Adam basically showed all the drawings and everything to Saltzman and Broccoli. And we're like, well, here's what I'm thinking for this amazing lair inside a volcano and they looked at it and were like, can you do this for a million dollars? And he went, yeah, I can. I, yeah, I think we can do this for a million dollars. And they went, okay, go ahead. And then he's like, oh, crap, now I have to actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this set is incredible. Oh, it's amazing. It's so good. If you've never seen a Bond movie before, you can probably picture this set in your mind. This is parodied by everything. This is Scorpio's lair in The Simpsons. This is yeah. 
this is like dr evil's lair in austin powers like Mm -hmm. it is the absolute platonic ideal of a specter base inside a volcano this is this is what the like the base the incredibles is going for like it is the specter set (laughs) apparently lighting this set was a nightmare and required oh i don't doubt it you know required like every lamp that pinewood film studios had on hand (laughs) (laughs) uh i love how over the top the set is it's got a a helicopter landing pad it's got a rocket launch pad it's got its own monorail it's got an office area with like shutters that open and close and overlook the entire pot like area down below like it looks like a death star i i would be very surprised in fact to learn that the design for the interiors of the Death Star were not at least in part inspired by this. To describe it, if you're not watching the video version, there's a giant circle in the roof of this massive cavernous space. And that retracts because it is, it's meant to look like the lake in the caldera of this dormant volcano. And so the entire lake surface, which is just metal, it's not even water, retracts and then helicopters fly. They had they the the rocket landing, I think, was a miniature, but they had a real helicopter taking off and landing through this set. Like that's how big this thing was. It's it's unreal. Yeah. With the rocket now landed, the shutters to the control room open back up. Spectre number three, played by the returning Bert Kwok, who played the Chinese physicist in Goldfinger, is on the radio giving sort of barking orders to everyone in the in the main room. And then we see a chair turn around and there is a man in a suit. We don't see his face, but we do see that he is gently petting a white cat. And we're like, oh, it's him. It's Spectre number one from those other movies. So yeah, I guess this is the moment where we actually find out for sure that it's Spectre who's doing all this. I don't know exactly when we find out the full story of their plot, but basically they are... Who are they even working for? We we don't know. So the things we learn over the course of this scene are the man behind it is Blofeld. It is Spectre that is doing the thing. They were hired by, in the film it's only referred to as a great power, but the implication, it is China has hired them to start a war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in order to, they would undermine each other so that China can ascend to become the world's new global superpower. Right, because after this scene, Blofeld retires to his apartment, which is connected directly to the control room and also looks absolutely astonishing and has a pool of piranha in it to meet with a couple of, Chinese businessmen basically to shake them down for more money. I don't even know if they're businessmen. They're probably part of the government or something. They're crime families. Who knows? He, you know, and he's basically like, okay, well, we're going to do this for even more money now. And they're like, what? Well, we didn't agree to that. And he's like, well, I mean, you've seen the operation. Do you want this war to happen or not? Also, my enormous bodyguard is going to throw a huge chunk of meat into the piranha <laughs> pond and you can see how lethal they are so i'm also threatening you personally if you don't give me this money i guess yeah and there's a great little exchange a he throws the meat and he's like they can skeletonize a man in 30 seconds but the the great little exchange is like this is extortion extortion is my business gentlemen at least one of those e's inspector stands for extortion right yeah yeah it does Revenge, yeah. extortion, counterintelligence, uh, terror. Uh, te- that's it. What it is? S P E C T R E, the special executive for counterintelligence, terrorism, revenge, and extortion. That's that's what it is. Thank you. Yeah, it took me a minute, but I got there. So anyhow, they they agree. <laughs> yeah, they. You know, he makes it. He makes a strong argument. I wanted to say actually that the the idea for having the secret volcano lair came up because the production crew was looking around for a castle to use, you know, like a traditional Japanese castle. And 
they were doing all these reconnaissance and they couldn't find a castle that was sort of like near the fishing village like they needed. They used Himeji Castle as Tiger Tanaka's base of operations where he's training his army of ninjas that we'll see shortly. It's a you know National Historic Site of Japan. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It, it was built in, oh God, 1333. But they couldn't find a castle where they needed for the Spectre Lair until someone informed them Japan never built castles near the sea, <laughs> you know, because it's not strategically beneficial. And they were like, ah, and they were doing the reconnaissance and then they saw the volcano. And then I think it was Ken Adam was like, oh, I have an idea. You know, what we could do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hollow out a volcano. And I mean, and thus began the longtime tradition of bad guys hiding in hollowed out volcanoes. So anyway, sorry, Blofeld calls <laughs> after he lets these Chinese people leave. He calls Osato and Ms. Brandt down to also talk to him. And you remember that X-ray from Osato's office? I do. He's got that. And he's like, yo, hey, Osato, fun, fun question. Do you, do you know what kind of gun this is? And Osato's like, uh, yeah, that's a Walther PPK. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Weird how that is. We only know... <laughs> One person who uses this gun is James Bond, and so I was like, "Oh, but but he's but he uh, he's dead." I thought I thought he was dead. I, what, what? And it's like, yeah, I guess he's not dead. You should have killed him. And he gets he gets really annoyed about that, and so he tells them tells them both to leave. <laughs> so, point of order before we move on. Before we move on, in a previous Bond movie, we have the issue of a, a Walther PPK to Bond as the new standard issue weapon for all double O agents. Yeah. This is the only agent. This is the only person they know who uses a Walther PPK, a mass produced common gun so that is with, that we have previously established is is issued at standard to all double O agents. Is Bond the only double O agent that has ever interfaced with Spectre? I find that hard to believe. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? It is a little, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, MI6 has updated their standard standard issue in the years between Dr. No and now, and, uh, and Bond, as ever, is holding on tradition as the last holdout still using, using a Walther PPK. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, that was my objection to this scene. Their, their reason for thinking it's Bond is, is violating canon because these movies are so concerned with continuity. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, why didn't you kill this dude? And Osato's like, we tried, but Ms. Brandt failed. And then he's like, all right, I, yeah, I dismiss you both. Get out of here. Go kill him again. Don't fail this time. We don't tolerate failure. And so Osato crosses the bridge and starts to head out of the office. And then Brandt goes to follow him. And when she steps onto the bridge, the bridge trap door opens dropping her into the piranha pool and she is eaten by piranhas much to the horror of of osato looking on and uh then blofeld sort of reiterates it's like go (laughs) go kill him and don't fail again and osato makes his escape yeah blofeld has just like a foot pedal (laughs) (laughs) it's like a singer sewing machine foot pedal i think it is yeah bond arrives (laughs) at tiger's ninja training base of operations which as i mentioned is himeji castle and it turns out that ninja demonstration was a big saving grace for a bunch of these movies actually because the production crew like the director lewis gilbert and saltzman and broccoli and the cinematographer and the location scouter and i think even peter hunt the editor were going to be flying back to england from japan on one of their early trips out there and then soon before they were boarding the plane they got word that they could go watch a live ninja demonstration and they were like oh well that sounds like great fun whatever sure move our flights we'll we'll get a different get a different flight and they went and watched that instead and the flight that they were all supposed to be on crashed and like there were no survivors so they were all like oh god you know that that very sort of you know can't can't really imagine the future that might have happened on their you know on their on their regard 
you know they were they were very shaken by that understandably but this you know they were able to get ninja demonstrations into the movie too yeah but yeah what a oof yeah we're now at the point where the movie kind of goes off the rails in terms of plotting yeah it's been pretty tight up till now fairly tight the the major thing that we're going to have to deal with from this point forward is that the plot the plan that Tanaka and Bond come up with at this point they're pretty sure there's something up with the volcano right but they haven't really figured out what's wrong with it uh, but they want to make sure that that nobody catches on to the f- fact that Bond is there and uh, having just been attacked by helicopters they're pretty sure that there's some heat on them so they come up with the plan of infiltrating the island because it's just a small fishing community on the island by disguising Bond as a Japanese person. Now, here's the thing for me. I remembered this because I mentioned it at the end of last episode. I was very worried about this because over the course of the first couple movies, they have not had, shall we say, a good track record. You know, in our first episode, we talk about several characters who are meant to be Chinese being played by white actors in Chinese makeup, including changing the tone of their skin and putting on prosthetic eye pieces. Now, there is a difference, and it's a nuance, but I do believe there is a difference between taking a white actor and saying, no, no, this is a Japanese character, and having someone in the universe of the movie being a white person disguising themselves as a Japanese person. In that instance, we're not being told by the production, no, no, this is definitely a Japanese person, wink. We are are aware that this is a white person disguising themselves. And I think that is an important distinction. What makes this not as bad for me is that it is profoundly unconvincing oh yeah it is absolutely unbelievable that anybody would ever look at james bond in this disguise and not immediately realize he is not japanese for some reason that really takes the edge off for me because it is (laughs) laughable it is like oh it is who is buying this the man doesn't look Japanese. He's wearing a bowl cut wig. He looks like a Romulan. He really does look like a Romulan. He doesn't look remotely Japanese even a little bit. And he doesn't try to sell it either. In in very much the like Sean Connery as a Russian with a uh, Scottish accent, he is Sean Connery as a Japanese man with a Scottish accent. Despite his quip to Money Penny that we didn't mention earlier in the movie that he took I think he says he took Oriental languages at Cambridge or something. Yes. It, a first, I believe. Yeah. He still walks into a room and, Konbanwa! You know, like he's not... <laughs> he Sure, maybe you know the words, but there's pronunciation and accenting that you need to do to actually speak proper Japanese. It's not an easy language. And so it's like, on the one hand, it is undeniably problematic on the other hand it's definitely not in the same wheelhouse of the shit that they pulled pardon me in (laughs) dr no especially when by all accounts the production was absolutely adamant that all the japanese roles be played by japanese actors that that was a a big thing for them that they wanted to do which they did, and that's good. And so, again, the fact that it's in-universe, that they're like, we're going to disguise you, and we're not trying to, from a production perspective, Mm -hmm. they're not trying to pass anything off at us, I do think puts it in a different wheelhouse. And again, it's just the least convincing disguise I've ever seen. So I'm like, okay, I guess, fine, buddy, whatever. I mean, I'm going to say this is a straight-up, your mileage may vary moment, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. To to anybody watching it, I I don't want to excuse it because it is extremely like it is quite insensitive, particularly the way they choose to make him up, which is literally a bowl cut wig, some eye pieces and dyeing his skin. It is it is not convincing, but it's also not great. That said, it could have been way, way worse. He doesn't do like a caricature. No, thank God. I mean, he basically is Sean Connery 
still, right? Like, yeah. if he's not even trying to pretend to not be Sean Connery. The actual characterization is is not characterized. He's not doing an accent other than his own. Your mileage may vary on this entire plot. It's also like he's so absolutely oblivious to Japanese customs and mannerisms. Like, I assume that this is the fault of the the writers and the directors and the producers all being white and mostly British. But like when he was pretending to be Mr. Fisher going to talk to Mr. Osato, if you're actually looking to engage in a business relationship, effing bow, my dude. Like he didn't even, <laughs> he he barely deigned to shake hands. Like what a rude thing to do to a Japanese businessman. You know, he didn't bow. <laughs> Like, come on, right? Like, it's clear that Bond has no concept of how to actually interact with someone from Japan. Yeah. He knows what temperature sake should be served at, though. Oh, good job. Good job, buddy. (laughs) So culturally sensitive. The correct Uh, temperature. So anyhow. After his transformation. After his transformation, we learn the plan. He's going to be smuggled onto the island. He's going to take a local wife for reasons, and he's going to live among them until he can figure out what's going on. He doesn't have much time. Like this is this whole thing is happening with a one week timeline to the launch. But anyhow, he's he's going to live on the island. He's going to pose as a fisherman. He is going to train as a ninja to learn the ninja arts, and then he's going to join Tiger and one hundred of Tiger's trained ninja army to assault the base once they figure out what's going on one night during training an assassin breaks into his room and like this is actually a really great scene (laughs) Mm -hmm. so he and aki are sleeping together on the floor and they're asleep and the assassin very stealthily like removes a tile out of the roof silently and sneaks into the rafters above the bed unrolls a thread from the roof down to just above their faces and then tips a little vial of poison onto the thread which runs this really like well shot droplet of poison down the thread towards bond's mouth and at the last second bond rolls over and aki rolls in to fill the place where bond was and the poison drips onto her lip you know she sort of licks her lips in her sleep the the ninja's like ah heck (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and starts to make an escape. Aki starts to suffocate. Like she starts to have a reaction and, and starts to, to suffocate. Bond, of course, wakes up, kills the assassin, then turns around and, and finds Aki, who is like dying from the poison. And she dies, which sucks because Aki has been great through this whole film. The alarm is called and, and Tanaka runs in because of the commotion of Bond fighting the assassin and Aki dies and and Tanaka is like, "Welp, that's no good." This was, as you say, brilliantly shot and the lighting on the poison dripping down the thread and what a cool idea. Love all of that. What bothers me the most about this is that Tanaka was like, you know, you'll take a Japanese wife so that it looks like, you know, you're blending in and Bond and Aki are like, "Oh, we could." Uh? And he's like, "No, no, 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 no. It's got to be someone from the fishing village." And Aki dies and then bond marries kissy suzuki who is from the fishing village who is also an undercover agent and very capable and they're essentially the same character in that they serve the same purpose to the plot and they have a lot of the same characterizations and at the end of the movie bond and kissy are the ones hanging out and making out and philandering and all of that and it's like just this weird it's aki for the whole movie and then stop and then this new character pick up where that left off do you remember in beer fest when landfill drowns in the beer and then his brother shows up and is like hi i'm his twin brother you know you can call me landfill he's told me all about you guys so i know everything about you just keep doing all the same in jokes and everything and treat me exactly the same and they're like okay and it's like the character never died it's like that it's what an incredible point of reference to draw (laughs) <laughs> well, it's it's a hilarious moment in that movie because it's supposed to be a comedy, right? But in this, yeah. it's just this it's this weird their characters are essentially identical and serve the same role in the movie. And it would have been 
more satisfying to just have it be yeah. Aki the whole time rather than yeah. like, oh, we got 40 minutes left in this movie. Here's a new character. But she, she's basically the same character as before. Why? It's I don't know. I, I think it's bad. I, I don't know. I, I think they do both characters dirty in this movie, like Aki and Kissy. In, in part because like the one distinguishing feature of Kissy as compared to Aki is that Kissy is like way less forward and way less like confident in her actions she is more submissive except that she's also no no this is a job we're not sleeping together like we we're, we're married but i'm sleeping over here and you're sleeping over there oh that's right she does do, she does do that bonds like we're newlyweds we're supposed to be on vacation no vacation this is a job yeah the the whole like introduction of kissy as well bond is told it's like oh you're gonna take a local wife and he's like well i hope she's attractive tiger is like no she has the face of a pig and then we have the whole like wedding procession scene where bond is there and there are like three wives and three grooms a woman walks up and you see bond sort of suspiciously eyeing her and she's she's not like model beautiful and a little older and he's sort of like suspiciously eyeing her and then she goes with a different guy and then like another one comes up and she goes with a different guy and then and then kissy comes up and is like model gorgeous and he's like ah of course this is this is the right one and it's like i don't know like it's meant to be funny but it's mostly just gross and objectifying (laughs) also because tiger i guess was like trying to goof on bond is like nah she's a total dog bro and then it turns out she's actually hot he's like i got you you thought you were gonna have to pretend marry an ugly woman also further evidence for this like being largely interchangeable is that these roles literally got changed because miyahama who plays kissy suzuki and akiko wakabayashi who plays aki were originally cast as the opposite roles oh wow but neither of them could speak english so they were brought to England to learn how to speak English, and Akiko Wakabayashi took to it a lot better, whereas Miyahama struggled to learn English. And because Aki has more spoken dialogue, they were like, okay, well, we'll have Akiko play Aki and we'll have Mia play Kissy. And so they dubbed Kissy over with Nikki Vanderzeel again. So they were like, all right, well, we'll just swap you then. Although... Akiko Wakabayashi's character was originally named Suki, and she was like, can we make it Aki? And they were like, okay, sure, that sounds great. So they changed the character's name to Aki. But yeah, originally they were cast as the opposite roles, and then when one of them was better at English, they were like, ah, okay, well, we'll just swap them. Because it doesn't matter. <sighs> cool. So they do a wedding, and they get to the fishing village. Once they get to the village, and they have settled in, they get a lead from Kissy, who who notes that there is a cave at the base of the volcano on the island where one of the Ama girls rowed her boat into the cave and then the boat floated out and she was dead. They're, they're like, there was no explanation for how this happened. So they go out on the fisher boats the next day and do recon at the cave. They break away from the fishing fleet to row over to the cave and try and see what's up. And as they, they go into the cave, they realize that the cave is like full of poison gas and that that's what killed the the woman who was there previously. So they they jump into the water to, you know, not be breathing the gas and swim out of the, the cave and establish that, oh, OK, there's definitely something up they end up climbing the volcano and getting into the caldera and then sort of down the other side and bond realizes that the lake in the caldera is fake and he like throws a rock at it. he's like how deep are these and she's like oh they're usually very deep and so he throws a rock at it and it skitters across the metal surface he's like oh okay i get it this is a lair they see a helicopter fly past them and then go down into the volcano and just not come back up and they're like what in the heck yeah and when they get over the lip it's gone they can't see it anyhow he sends kissy back to tell tiger that okay we are on to something we need to assault the volcano because there's clearly a base inside this volcano and bond is like i'm gonna get in so he manages to wait until the roof opens again then sort of like manages to climb into the rafters under the roof and drop into the base the roof by the way is opening because the americans have surprised 
moved up their next rocket launch and Spectre is launching their capsule eating spacecraft with CCCP markings to try and just really hammer home. No, it's the Ruskies that are doing it. You should go to war. Also, we learn sort of in the process that they're sending the capsule up to go capture the the American spaceship, but they're not actually planning to retrieve it. They give orders to blow up the capsule once they've done it because the, like they don't want it being tracked back to them at that point. Anyhow, Bond breaks into the volcano. We have this great scene of him il- infiltrating in the most impractical way possible. I, ad- I adore it. It's so stupid. Suction cups. Yeah, suction cups on his hands and knees that he is using to climb down this rough stone wall like the, the the wall is not nearly smooth enough for the suction cups to work I, I i love the thought of like this guy in a gray suit like spidering his way down this concrete wall trying to evade notice in this giant like hangar filled with hundreds of people all who have good reason to look up it's so silly he sneaks around inside this place lie on that cool monorail i god i just love everything about this set it's so good there's a working little monorail thing like it's very it's it would be perfect self-parody if this wasn't the source yeah right (laughs) it's so good so he skulks around and he finds out where the one surviving american astronaut and the two cosmonauts are being held they're just sort of chatting they're like oh so yeah what what do you do for astronaut training they're like well we call it cosmonaut training you know it's like like, of course you would yeah uh, oh i get we're different Uh, yeah and then bond you know pokes his head in the doorway of the jail and is like hello (laughs) and they're like what the (laughs) hell and then he blows the door out open and they stage a not particularly quiet jailbreak but i guess it only attracts four guards which is useful because there's four of them and they're all the same size of suit yeah they knock out the guards bond tells the astronauts to put on the suits and just sort of like blend in basically rescue is on the way just like put on their their outfits and keep a low profile and he proceeds to go and take the place of one of the actual astronauts that is planned to go up in the next capsule yeah, with the with the help of his other astronaut friends, disguises himself. I guess he's disguised as a CCCP astronaut just so he can get closer to, or I think he's actually planning on going up in it to sabotage it in some way. There is a brief sequence of Kissy Suzuki swimming back to the village and being buzzed by a helicopter firing at the water and she eventually makes it out and because she can hold her breath for a long time and so they're like oh i guess we got her because she didn't come back up but that's a very brief sequence and probably not strictly critical (laughs) it should be mentioned that the original cut of this movie lewis gilbert's regular editor thelma connell did a three hour cut and people were like this this is not great this is too long now peter hunt had been editing all of the bond films up to this point and he really wanted to direct one and he was like hey i want to direct the next movie and they were like no peter you can't sorry you can't direct one of these movies and so he was like okay then i'm not whatever i'm out and he left the production he wasn't going to be editing it and they ran into him in tokyo because he was on vacation (laughs) and they ran into him (laughs) and they were like hey buddy sorry we left on such bad terms you want to you want to come direct second unit and so he was like (laughs) oh you know what Okay, so he ended up being the second unit director for this movie. And then after this three hour edit received a really bad response, they were like, we got to get Peter back in on this. So they brought Hunt back in to do the final edit of this movie. Basically, as a result of that and his good work on second unit for this, he was then allowed to direct the next movie on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Spoilers for next episode of this podcast. I think that was a huge mistake. Well, (laughs) got the hot takes coming out. I will talk more about that next episode, but yeah. Although I think technically there's a there's a bonus episode between now and then. Oh, sweet. Which we have promised in various places. Well, I'll talk about that later. (laughs) So Bond tries to get onto the ship and they're like, he's not acting like an astronaut. I don't know what it is like. He He has an air conditioner unit with him Mm. and the other astronaut like hands it off before climbing in and he's still holding it while climbing in and blofeld sees this on the monitor calls out he's like bring that astronaut to me and has him like apprehended and brought to him and then they're like dispatch the reserve astronaut and and the reserve astronaut goes up in the ship and uh, he is taken to blofeld's office he's like whoever you are you made a mistake take that guy's helmet off and then he does and mr osato does like an amazing double take in the thing he's like because he realizes (laughs) that it's james bond and then we finally get to see 
the face of Ernst Stavro Blofeld, portrayed by Donald Pleasance, who I always think of his role in The Great Escape as the forgerer who eventually goes blind, as this really deeply sympathetic character in that movie. Mm. So I was never able to quite buy him as truly evil in this role. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Also, the previous iterations of Blofeld that we've seen, which were Anthony Dawson's body, were very, very lithe. Yes. And I'm not calling Donald Pleasance out of shape, but he looks different, physically different than what we've seen of him so far. And the little glimpses that we've seen through cracks and windows and things of Blofeld's head before now, he had a full head of hair. Yes, but here we see a bald man with an enormous dueling scar across his right eye. It is unsettling that at no point that he is on screen does he blink. It's really quite creepy. But yeah, here is Blofeld. This would be the first and last time that Donald Pleasance would play the role because Blofeld was played by a different actor basically every time he appeared. Originally, he was going to be played by Jan Werick, who was a Czech theater actor. They shot with him for like five days before... Lewis Gilbert worked up the nerve to go to the producers and basically say, this guy is not going to work. <laughs> he described him as a, a slightly menacing Father Christmas. Wow. Yeah, he was just this sort of very affable, white-bearded gentleman. And they were like, this guy is not upsetting enough. <laughs> we need to fire mall Santa. So they ended up with uh, Donald Pleasance. And to be fair, right. I, I do like Donald Pleasance in the role. It's entirely on me that I'm just like, I can't buy this guy's truly evil because I love him so much in The Great Escape. No, I, I, I think he's great in the part. I think he's mm. the right amount of like unsettling and it, like intimidating and calculating. Like, I think he does a great job. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and again, he's certainly the quintessential Bond villain. I mean, you know, he's this is who Dr. Evil is based on. You know, this is... Yeah. is Anytime someone is doing a parody of Blofeld, they're doing Donald Pleasance, right? They're yes. doing the the scar and the bald head and the hello, Mr. Bond, you know, whereas that that sort of affectation would not necessarily follow through in, you know, when Telly Savalas or Charles Gray play him later. And seeing that Bond is still alive and Osato's second assassination attempt has failed, Blofeld kills Osato. They do the whole rocket launch. They undress bond from his spacesuit and confiscate everything and then we see the ninjas attack oh yeah you know because the rocket launches and tiger's hundred ninjas approach the crater and according to the call sheet for that day there were like i think it was 98 extras so practically a <laughs> hundred ninjas yeah two ninjas twisted their ankles on the way up the side of the mountain <laughs> well at least one ninja literally broke their ankles descending from the crater in the set oh well, that's not funny anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> and Blofeld makes a point of showing off. It's very conspicuous, but he's like, here, giant bodyguard, hold on to this key for this button here. This button, this is the blow up the ship button. Did everybody catch that, that this is the button that will blow up the ship? Everybody right. on the same page here? You in the back? You got that? This is the, and he has the key for it, just so everyone's clear. Great. Okay. Oh, Bond, you're still here? You know, <laughs> it's one of those like... <laughs> You know, one of those very sort of silly moments, but yeah. Yeah. They see all the ninjas coming and they there's, you know, auto guns on the outside of the crater to mow a bunch of them down. Actually, I love this line, actually. He's like, this attack will fail. We will kill all of these ninjas. You can watch it on television. You know, that <laughs> it's like, it's, he delivers it in the manner of someone saying, I found this great new show that you should watch. You know, it's like, <laughs> check this out. You can watch it on TV. Isn't it great? And Bond yeah. asks, he's like, well, if I'm going to be watching all my friends die, can I? at least have my cigarettes you remember in the first movie when the guy was like well if you're gonna question me can i have my cigarettes and bond was like okay sure fine here yeah. you go and it was cyanide and this time yeah. same courtesy blofeld's like yes sure find find this man his cigarettes something we didn't mention back in tiger's castle is that he has these tiny rocket launcher cigarettes which are not a gimmick this was a real thing that a weapons manufacturer was trying to get and they they wanted in the bond film so they could show it off hoping the u.s military would buy it that's amazing but the 
ammunition was so prohibitively expensive <laughs> that nobody bought it and they were like they they went out of business or something but uh... the the tiny cigarette hiding rocket launcher thing is real which is <laughs> ludicrous yeah so bond uses that little rocket cigarette to kill the guy standing by the crater roof controls so that he can run over and open the crater up so that the ninjas can start to bailey down the crater he manages to hold off the guards for long enough that several of them can get down the falling ropes and the like everybody rappelling in that mm. shot is another like it's so cool <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you just see the ropes unfurl from the roof and yeah. then all these people like slide down the ropes it's so cool and then one of them blows up the roof so that all the other ninjas can get inside. And then th there's just this whole massive set piece of explosions and guns and people flying. This is one of the first movies where they use the stuntman trampolines. So there's like a lots of, well, Western movies anyway, people, you know, being flown by explosions and flipping and jumping and flying through the air. And it's just this, this massive action set piece that's mm -hmm. pretty great. There's a big, huge fight. There, like it's a big huge fight it's probably the biggest hugest fight we've seen in a bond movie to date it's way more entertaining since it's not in the water yes there's lots of <laughs> dynamic action taking place and it doesn't go on too long it comes yeah. close but it doesn't go on too long in part because bond is doing his own thing through this whole mm -hmm. battle so it's like we are following bond as this giant battle is going around going on around them props by the way to the one ninja who's there with a katana and just like sorting people left and right yeah that guy's rad but bond has been like taken away from blofeld's office and he ends up having to fight his way back to blofeld's office through all this like destruction and nonsense that's going on because he of course has to get to blofeld's bodyguard who has the self-destruct key for the spaceship so that he can stop that from happening meanwhile blofeld is like trying to make a getaway bond manages to sort of like separate himself from blofeld and and blofeld like goes to make his getaway while bond fights his way back to the control room bond gets back to the control room and there's a big fight with blofeld's bodyguard and this is the second real big guy who is impervious to damage this is much more impervious to damage they do the whole thing where like bond punches him in the gut and the guy doesn't even respond because he just does not feel pain bond once again gets trash canned by this dude until he manages to push him into the the piranha tank and uh, the guy gets piranified bond gets the key he manages to activate the self-destruct and we, we have another situation where it's like approaching the American craft and they can see it coming and it's so close. And then just moments before it overtakes the American spaceship and starts, you know, the, the World War Three, it blows up and the day is saved. But while he's doing this, Blofeld activates the self-destruct system in the base itself. The base's self-destruct causes the whole volcano to erupt and, and things to explode. Because there are there are cutaways in there of the Pentagon and like the Secretary of Defense basically being like, as soon as that ship eats our spaceship, then it's war. So everyone get ready to fire all the missiles. And then the <laughs> yeah. ship blows up and he's like, all right, everyone, don't fire those missiles. I've decided yeah. we're fine now. You know, so down to the wire international war tension so then bond reconvenes with like kissy and tanaka and they make their way out of the base with all of the surviving ninjas as the base is destroyed in this giant volcanic eruption they swim out into the ocean near the exit to the cave that bond and, and kissy had sort of reconned earlier a plane flies overhead and drops rafts to them somehow bond and kissy get their own raft while there are like a dozen ninjas to every other raft, they start to smooch. Some time passes, and then from under their raft, a submarine surfaces, right. lifting their submarine up. And then we cut to below decks, and M says, all right, Money Penny, go and get 007. And she's like, it would be a pleasure. <laughs> heads up, heads up on deck. And then it says, actually, it doesn't even say we'll return. It says... The end of You Only Live Twice, but James Wa Bond will be back on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Not will be back in. It just, right. Anyway. So, yeah, that's 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 the movie. We don't see Blofeld. Like, Blofeld gets away. It is assumed. Yeah. All right. So. Like, overall, 
this was a lot of fun. It's pretty good on the whole. Yeah, it's it's honestly, yeah, it's honestly really good. I don't I don't know what I was expecting because again, the only thing I remembered was that they disguised Bond as a Japanese guy. So I was going in going, oh, this is gonna ruin this whole movie, and it it doesn't. It's not good, but it doesn't ruin the movie for me. And you know, there are a couple things with sort of pacing, and there's as as we've discussed, there's like this scene didn't need to be here, but. No, I liked it. I liked it quite a bit, actually. Yeah, this is a fun one. This mm-hmm. is a fun one. It's it's not the worst. It's not the best, it, but it is good on the whole. I would say it's strongly better than average. Now we're getting into so many movies that I need to actually go back to the spreadsheet <laughs> and see what I've said previously. So pre-title, it's got a lot of good stuff. It's got space. It's got some cool sets it's relevant to the plot of the movie and there's no sort of like big fight or stunt per se there's the stuff in space and then james bond dies and it cuts to opening title but how good is it in what we've seen so far it was okay honestly i agree i i don't think it was gosh now i have to try and remember everything else we've talked about (laughs) welcome to my hell (laughs) all right i'm gonna lead this one yeah, go for it. I think the pre-title sequence is not as good as From Russia With Love. My reasoning for that is that it does the James Bond is dead again. This time it's directly plot related rather than just a misdirect, but it's repeating a verse. The special effects shot is awesome, but mm-hmm. it's really just a scene from the movie. It's not really like a hook. It's a bit of a hook, but it's it's like they put the inciting incident of the film in the in the pre-roll i think i like it better than goldfinger because of that i think the effect shot of like having the space thing is cool and inventive but i don't think i like it as much as from russia with love from russia with love's opening is so has so much clarity of purpose in what it's doing it's doing one thing only executing it on, on it super well and this one is trying to do like start two different plot threads and mm. like it's basically as i say it's just a scene from the movie and it's repeating something that from russia with love already did so i would put it at my number two i think it's better than the seagull hat so on one level nothing is better than the seagull hat <laughs> on the other level <laughs> i completely agree with you i i totally agree with everything that you said and i i put it in the same place all right opening title song wise this is under for me this is under thunderball but better than from russia with love so this is a solid third at this point i agree so i'm i'm at goldfinger thunderball you only live twice all right and then the film as a whole gosh you know i really liked it i mean (laughs) the the parts i didn't like i definitely didn't like but i mean generally speaking the dialogue is snappy the plot is fun the structure is overall good i think looking to dr no as an inspiration was a smart move and i yeah i i certainly liked it more than thunderball (laughs) yeah i'm trying to gosh i guess it's a toss-up what am i what are my rankings at the moment i guess it's a toss-up between whether or not i liked it more than dr no because i i don't think it's as well structured and paced as from russia with love and i like too much about goldfinger so i think it's depending on whether or not it's above or below dr no in my estimation and no i don't i think i still think dr no is probably better there's so many things in this i love the big marks against it for me are disguising james bond as a japanese guy the couple sort of scenes that aren't really necessary and for me i think the the big thing is the interchangeability of the characters of Aki and Kissy and the fact that they do literally interchange them. And I don't mean the actresses. I mean that they literally go, it's Aki through the whole first half of the movie and then she's dead and then they introduce Kissy and then Kissy continues that same storyline. I think, I think like you said, I think it does both characters dirty, you know, that it should have been Aki making out with bond in the life raft at the end of the movie i agree with that i also think it's not as good as dr no i like dr no better but of course my my ranking of dr no is higher i put this above goldfinger i think Mm. that's my hot take of the day 
So I had to deliberate on this one quite a bit. I thought about it. I was I was staring at my letterbox to count last night, which now I'm spoiling things. You can if you follow me on letterbox, do you get advanced notice of these things if you know where to look? Because I maintain a list on letterbox of my ranking of the Bond movies. Uh, <laughs> um, staring at it last night, trying to figure out where to put it so that I was ready to go when we recorded this episode. I think I put it above Goldfinger just because of all the like narrative structure problems that we talked about with relation to Goldfinger. Whereas mm-hmm. like this movie has a few extraneous scenes, but at least the the bold notes work, like the broad strokes. Yeah. I don't even remotely disagree with anything you're saying, by the way. I, I'm 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 on board with you. I, I think like Goldfinger is definitely a I say this with a hint of irony, I guess, is a tighter film in that, that once again it like As I said at the time, I didn't think it actually had that much going on. It's very straightforward. I think You Only Live Twice has a little bit more going on. I think they both are pretty loose in terms of plotting. Like, I think there's they're they're not really like, you know, really tightly woven plots. But I think at least You Only Live Twice is a little more ambitious in that regard in what it's trying to do. I think the cinematography in this one is a big step up. That's true, actually. Over a Goldfinger and Thunderball. I just have more fun with this movie. Yeah. So it's it's my number three behind Dr. No, but above Gold, uh, Goldfinger. Oh, gosh. You, you're making a lot of good points. I'm not trying to make a convincing points. argument. You don't, you don't have to agree with no, me. No, I know. I know. I know. You're, <laughs> you're making a lot of good points. I agree with all of that. You're totally right. For simplicity, I'm going to stay with what I said before. But all right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, this whole this list is going to be a complete gordian not by the end of this podcast so oh absolutely i'm not gonna worry about it too much yeah i don't think anybody is gonna judge you if you at some point are like i have reconsidered and i want to change this (laughs) or at one day you're like i no longer stand by my rankings oh i may not stand by the rankings that i've already made by the time we get five episodes in the future who knows you know yeah 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 But I think that is going to do it for You Only Live Twice. A a strange title, to be sure. Apparently, You Only Live Twice. It's from a quote. It's like, once when you're born and again when you die. One life for yourself and one for your dreams, according to the the intro theme. Yeah, I mean, Blofeld says it. He's like, oh, he said the name of the movie in the movie. Because he thought that Bond was dead. And so he's like, well, you know, because it's like, well, you only live once. And so he says, well, you only live twice, Mr. Bond. (laughs) Ha ha ha. I suppose we haven't mentioned our Bond moment, but we have talked about this one for an awfully long time. So choose your own Bond moment and let us know in the comments. <laughs> Until next time, <laughs> uh, this podcast and everything that Loading Ready Run does is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Thanks so much, Matt, for talking Bond with me. Yeah, thank you. Shout out also to Matt Griffiths, who does the video editing on these and Heather, who does general podcast admin for us. And... We will talk to you on the next episode. This podcast will return. Mm-hmm.